This is the Truth Frequency Radio Network. We are TFR. Truth Frequency Radio. I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no bias. In the Sam Hill did we just see last week, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, it is I, America's evil genius, Travis Cook, back with you here on TruthFrequencyRadio.com, 90.7 FM in Denver. Great to be back with you for another week of eye-gouging, crotch-kicking, no-holds-barred political discussion. And I know that those of you who uh, listen to this show frequently, those of you who are regulars to our program, some of you have been with me for three years now, going back to the old YouTube show we used to do, and and, and you enjoy the times that we have together, the, the shows that we have, and you come to me when we do these programs, be it on radio here, be it on video, on YouTube, wherever it is, you come to me expecting some sort of uh, reasonable analysis, if you will, of what we are seeing politically. You come to me hoping to learn some sort of history on a lot of these topics and to learn maybe even what that history means for the future and to kind of help you put things in perspective. Dare I say it, you come to me in a lot of cases for some degree of guidance. A lot of you trust me, and I appreciate that. I don't take that lightly. I've I've had emails, I've had Facebook postings, Twitter postings from people that really do gain value from what we do on this show and really uh, really do place a degree and a level of trust in me. I'm not saying that to brag on myself. Uh, That's I'm just reporting to you what I hear from people and how what people say to me when they contact me, and I appreciate that. I take it seriously. I take it as a badge of honor. It would be really easy to take the old Dizzy Dean line and say it ain't bragging if you did it. I could do that, but I won't. But nevertheless, it is an amazing feeling to know that the things I say on here, the things I do on this show, have that kind of effect. They make people think. They make people reconsider things. They make people do a better job of trying to put this crazy, wacky world in perspective. And and I take that seriously. But after last week in the United States of America... After all of the things we saw, I have to be real honest with you. I'm not really sure exactly what kind of guidance I can give you today. After this last week, which has been... I can't even put into words what this last week has been in terms of what we've seen out of the Supreme Court and out of our culture and out of our media, and out of our press, and out of even our fellow citizens. I have a hard time looking at this scenario, looking at this environment that we're in today, and telling you, here is the way out. Here is what we do in response. Here is how we retort. Here is what we do to undertake the next battle. I'm not sure I know exactly how to tell you that. And again, I'm not saying that as a cop-out. I'm saying that to be truthful. I'm saying that as an admonition. You know, we conservatives are somewhat famous for telling people that our culture, our way of life in America, our Judeo-Christian values are under assault, and they are, consistently. And in a subtle and gradual sense they have been chipped away and chipped away since roughly the 1930s to the point that our way of life, our culture, our form of government is something that would be barely recognizable at all to somebody who lived a hundred years ago if they were to see it today. And when we say that, when we talk to people about that, so many times our enemies or people who don't even really pay attention to politics will claim that we're paranoid. They'll say we're paranoid. They say we see black helicopters. They say we just are looking for things that aren't there. 
But I don't know after the last week how anybody who is honest with themselves whatsoever can claim that we conservatives are still paranoid. I don't know how anybody who is intellectually honest whatsoever or who has had even a passing observation of what has happened in the last week can say anything other than conservative values, traditional values, Judeo-Christian morality, that the way we've undertaken government over these 240 years, I don't see how any honest person can say anything other than those concepts are under assault after last week. Now, maybe you disagree with us and, and you like the fact that those things are under assault, maybe so, but you would have to acknowledge that the assault is in full is in full bore, that we are not paranoid, we are not seeing the black helicopters, this all is very real. Early in the week, in the wake of the Dillon Roof shooting over in South Carolina, people were talking about the fact that a Confederate flag flies on the uh, grounds of the State House in South Carolina over, I believe, a Confederate memorial. I'm not sure why that would be surprising that you have a Confederate flag at a Confederate memorial. But evidently that's surprising or offensive to some people. And when that, in, that story initially broke that people were having such an issue with that and complaining and, and moaning and whatever else, I thought it was just one of those quick reaction things and it would be here and gone. But it's taken on a life of its own. The voices that demand the removal of the flag have gotten to the point, as ridiculous as their arguments are, they've gotten to the point that they've gotten the governor of the state, Nikki Haley, to spearhead an effort to remove the flag, that they have convinced businesses to stop selling any merchandise whatsoever with the Confederate flag. They have turned an innocent piece of fabric into uh, what they view as a lethal weapon, it would seem like. The flag didn't kill anybody. And later in the show, I will be going over with you my personal view on the Confederate flag, why it does not offend me, and why I encourage states like South Carolina to fly it. That will be later in the show. But the interesting thing about what we've seen is that those who were opposed to the Confederate flag, for whatever the reasoning might have been, those who claimed it was treasonous, and there's plenty of reason to debate that, those who claim that the Confederacy is not a part of our history that we should let not, not even acknowledge, let alone celebrate, those people did not allow any debate whatsoever. Now, I want you to stop and think about something. Any of you who have done any serious college-level work in history, you will know that for practically any historically significant event, there is plenty of room for debate, especially for things that do not happen in our lifetimes and for which the actual players are all dead. All we have to go off of is the evidence we have remaining. And from that evidence human beings being different as, as each of us are individually human beings can draw greatly different conclusions from those things we research we form opinions we debate we hash it out and with most historical topics that debate goes on well longer than we're alive from a historical perspective there is plenty of reason to debate the civil war now, I'm not going to hash out that whole debate here. Perhaps we will sometime on this program, but in case you haven't thought it through, there are plenty of reasons to debate whether the North was justified in going after the Southern states that seceded. There's plenty of debate over whether the, the Southern states had the legal right to secede to begin with. There is plenty of debate over whether the North went outside their own constitutional parameters in their actions in the Civil War. There's even debate 
over who started the darn civil war. There's even debate over whether it should be called a civil war at all. After all, in most civil wars, by the definition, you have an insurgency trying to take over a government. That did not happen in the civil war. You simply had a group of people saying, hey, we're gonna, we want independence, we want to form our own country, and that's it. Now, yes, you have the scourge of slavery involved in all of that. No one doubts that. But it's severely debatable whether slavery was the key issue of the war or not. Bottom line is all of those things can be debated, have been debated, and, and, and in light of nothing else should still be debated. But yet, a very loud group of the American public made the determination that the Civil War is not to be debated. They made the Civil War, they made the determination that the Civil War was only about slavery and racism and nothing else. A point that certainly could be hotly debated among anybody with even a cursory knowledge of the historical facts of the time. And furthermore, they tried to shout down any of us, and yes, that includes me, who dared to even play devil's advocate and point out history and make the statement that, hey, maybe there was more to this civil war than some of these, uh, some of these rent -a mob protesters were claiming. You see the removal of the Confederate flag or the movement to remove it, the controversy and so forth is not about the Civil War, it's not about the Confederate flag. This is about forcing or coercing society as a whole to accept one and only one viewpoint of history and to cease debate on any other possible explanation. This is about expunging history from the record and not about learning from it. It's a dangerous thing. And yet we saw it happen in really record time. It was scary how quickly this took hold. And then you move on later in the week, the Supreme Court essentially legalizing Obamacare. But the Supreme Court does so not only by, uh, not, not, not in terms of identifying in the Constitution what, what it is that makes Obamacare constitutional, no, they go about looking at the law and saying, well, words don't always mean what they say, or, or, or we can infer things, or essentially they made up a ruling, they made up a law out of whole cloth that was not there. Now, there's a lot of issues that come with that, as I'm sure you know. A lot of us on the conservative side have been fighting Obamacare with every breath in our bodies since it came about. And make no mistake, this Supreme Court ruling makes no difference to us. We will continue to fight it with every fiber of our being and every breath of our body. This fight does not end until that law is gone, period. And I don't care how many court cases it takes. I don't care how many trips to the Supreme Court it takes. I don't care how many times the House of Representatives or the Senate has to bring up a vote to repeal it. I don't care if nothing else gets done in this country. We will repeal that law. People telling us we should just accept it. It's the worst thing we can do. I remember, I don't remember, I wasn't alive, but I'm historically aware enough to know about the days of Social Security being implemented. And Franklin Roosevelt's key pieces of legislation and something that has done innumerable damage to this nation. If you want to know why we are in, in debt up to our eyeballs, the biggest reason for any of it is Social Security. And yes, there's a lot of people, even on our side of the aisle, who will not dare tell you that. There's a lot of people who will never say anything disparaging about Social Security, but by God, I will. Social Security was the single biggest mistake this nation ever made. Period. End of story. You look at any budget, the CBO numbers, and they will show you then entitlement spending, which consists of Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, takes up over two-thirds of our budget in a given year. That is spending, by the way, called entitlement spending, what it means, spending that is done by formula in the law, not done by budgetary concerns or budgetary measures, 
by the Congress. In other words, financial time bomb. Social Security did that. But I think back to the implementation of Social Security, and eventually Franklin Roosevelt died. Eventually, Harry Truman was out of office, and eventually the Republicans got back into power in 1952, Dwight Eisenhower. So you would have thought with such a horrific law, such a, a law that could be so devastating to America as we've seen it be in 2016, 2015, you would think the Republicans, once they got power, would have done all they could to eradicate it, and yet they did not. They accepted it. They funded it. They, they allowed it to stay. The result is the problems you see today with our debt. Likewise with Lyndon Johnson. So in other words, the, the, the Republicans gave up on finding Social Security. Likewise with Lyndon Johnson. Medicare, which takes up a lot of our entitlement spending. The great society that has ruined our inner cities and, and that is the key component to so much of the ills and the issues in black America today. Lyndon Johnson put that into place. Another fundamentally transformative moment in liberal politics. And then Richard Nixon gets into office in 1968. Does he go and undo the Great Society? Does he go and undo Medicare? No, he does not. Historians will often tell you that Lyndon Johnson created the Great Society. Richard Nixon funded it. And it's awfully hard to argue with them on that point. History bears that out. So there again, you have a liberal ideologue making some fundamentally transformative policy. The Republican gets in and they just accept it. They don't fight it. They don't destroy it. Well, those of us who are fighting Obamacare have learned from these lessons. We know that once you stop fighting such a horrific financial program, such as a program that will add to our entitlement spending even more that we can't afford, once you stop fighting it, then that financial time bomb is set off. It happened with Social Security. It happened with Medicare. Happen on the Great Society. It will happen on the Obamacare if we stop fighting it. So that's why we fight. And yet the Supreme Court essentially made up law that does not exist, which allegedly they aren't allowed to do, but they sure did their share of it this week. They codified Obamacare, essentially. And they lit the fuse on that time bomb. More to the point... There's some legal questions that all of this raises. Now, I'm not going to go into all of the legal scholarship behind that decision, nay or yay. There are plenty of other commentators who have done that. Plenty of other great pieces that have been written on that. You can go find them on your own. I suspect with this audience being who they are, a lot of you already have. But I would say this much. Given the manner in which the Supreme Court did not try to interpret the Constitution, but instead tried to interpret words that were not there in a law. It makes you wonder where does it all end? If the Supreme Court has the power to do this, where does that power end? If the Supreme Court can legislate from the bench in this case, where does it end? Are we at a point where the Supreme Court and the judicial system in general, the justice system, judicial branch in general, are we at a point where it is completely unpredictable? Where no matter what a law says, its legality, its constitutionality, or even how it's implemented, all boils down to what a court, particularly the Supreme Court, feels on a given day. Are we really in the wild, wild west of jurisprudence? This decision would make it seem as though we are. And what are the implications of that? What are the implications of a scenario in which the law really is not worth the paper it is printed on, where the law really is what a court says it is in a given day, and there's no recourse for it, and really you're just flipping a coin when you bring something up before the Supreme Court? That puts us into a very unpredictable society. We have an unpredictable set of rules. We have goalposts that are constantly shifting and we don't know where they are in that figurative sense. So how do you do business in the environment? If you're a private citizen, how do you go about your daily life in that environment? It's one thing to try not to break the law, but it's something else entirely to have 
no clue what the law means on a given day. That's where we are. So in addition to the concrete noose that is Obamacare being placed around our necks, we now have the added implication of a legal system that is completely unpredictable. And now we don't know if any of our laws are worth the paper they are printed on. And if those things weren't enough, we had the gay marriage ruling. Now, some of you have heard my opinion on gay marriage before. You know that personally I am against it. However, from a legal sense, I would be okay. A constitutional sense, I would be okay with the question being left up to the states. But the Supreme Court disagrees. The Supreme Court has told all of us that we have to accept gay marriage, that gays can get married in all 50 states, no matter what has been done in our states previously. Now, as I said, I have a, a personal issue with gay marriage. I disagree with it. And it is real tempting to me to go here into the realm of what in the, the heck makes the Supreme Court think they can overrule God, but I won't go there because, as I say, from a policy perspective, I'm okay with individual states deciding the question for themselves. Frankly, that's how I think most policy issues should be handled in our nation. So I won't go there. I will not go down the road of, even if you don't believe in the religious side of the argument, you can look at a couple thousand years of human history of male-female households and see, hey, it has a tendency to work out for the best that way. We won't even go there. Instead, the biggest issue I have with this is this gay marriage ruling indicates that as of right now, individual states and individual groups of people can no longer determine the acceptable lifestyles and the acceptable culture of their own state or region. For example, a lot of places in the uh, previous years, including Missouri, where we, where we record this show, a lot of places have had ballot initiatives, even state constitutional amendments, on the topic of gay marriage, whether for or against. In an awful lot of those places, the vast majority of them, gay marriage has failed when at the ballot box. Here in Missouri, I believe it failed by about around 70%, if I, if I am not mistaken. It failed overwhelmingly here. It wasn't even close. It was so one-sided, you wonder why it even got that. But what the Supreme Court has just told us is that even though 70% of the people here in the sovereign state of Missouri have looked at the idea of gay marriage and said, you know what, that's not really something that we want to be a part of our lifestyle here where we live. That this is not acceptable to us. It's not the type of, of environment that we as a state, we as a people wish to live in. And by a large margin, They've told us that even though that's the case, people from the outside are going to come in and say, no, you have to accept it. They're going to tell us how we have to live our lives. Now, for those of us who are Missourians with a historical perspective, that reeks of the Civil War once again when the federal government basically just came in and threw out a duly elected government because they were going to go with the Confederacy. It's not what a federal government's about, but that's what they're doing. So where do you go when you look at an environment like this, where the federal government is telling you what you have to do in your state, where they're putting an Obamacare around your neck, where they are creating an unpredictable legal environment that you don't know from one day to the next what's going to happen, and when you have a, a society and a small but vocal group of people in the media trying to force you to change your own history, force you to reinterpret your own history falsely, what do you do? It's hard to find an answer for that, but I tell you what, last week, before all of this happened, last week on this show, I think we came up with an answer. Last week, we talked about what should happen if Hillary Clinton wins in 2016, and I told you that the idea of secession must be on the table because... The differences in America will not only be political, but they will be moral, philosophical, and geographical. 
The electoral map will not look much different in 2016 than it's looked any other year, regardless of who wins. If Hillary wins, she's not going to win states in the South. She's not going to win states in the Midwest, except one or two. She's not going to win states in the West. She's going to do it off of the Northeast, the West Coast, and a couple of other states in the middle. That's how she's going to do it. And that's how it's been done for the last several elections. What that tells us is that the differences in this nation are irreconcilable. They're not just differences in politics, they're differences of right and wrong, differences of basic morality. And in that environment, how can we coexist together? I don't see how we can. At that point, and I think we're rapidly getting there, it may be time to say, let's, let's let bygones be bygones, let's do the adult thing. Y'all go your way up in the north and the west, we'll go our way in the south and the midwest. And if you guys want to live in a secular society where gays can do whatever they want and the law means nothing, and you can steal from the producers and give them the parasites, you go right ahead. You do that in New York and California. But for those of us who wish to live in a society where morality and Christianity and Judeo-Christian values carry the day, where the law means what it says and says what it means, where we can protect our own lives and households and determine our own fate of destiny in our lives, we should be able to do it. It's a big ask. But after this week, I don't know that there's much else in the way of alternative. It may be time for secession again. Folks, that's the first half of the Power Hour. We'll be back right here on Truth Frequency Radio. <laughs>